In this video, we are going to be discussing the topics of chapter 2, which is titled Water, the Solvent of Biochemical Reactions. It is important to understand, water is the most common solvent found in nature. On Earth, we actually find it in all three states of matter, which are solid, liquid, and gas. Without this substance, because it's um, so important and is found so abundantly on Earth, life as we know it could not exist. Now, we have heard from time to time that it is important that you drink water, drink water, and drink water. Indeed, because even the human body is around 70% made out of this molecule. Now, whenever we ingest water, as you can see in the bottom left corner image, you see that having that activity of ingesting water actually provides to the body this important solvent. And as you can see, it goes to different areas of the body. More importantly, water has particular roles and they are outlined on the right side of the slide. Now understand that this is a limited number of roles. There are more than this, but these are some that I think are important. Now, water is involved in cell health. It is because water is going to be the medium to transport not only nutrients, but also important molecules that are utilized in biochemical reactions, including oxygen. Now, because it is important, and as you can see, it is the transport, is the medium that it is utilized, it actually um, is involved in nutrient distribution. Um, as I mentioned before, water is involved in biochemical processes, but more importantly, whenever uh, food is being broken down, and we're going to be studying that when we go through metabolism, in this breaking down of these food items of this um, biomolecules, we are going to be extracting some nutrients inside of the body. Now, water, as you can see on the third one, is also involved in waste elimination. Understand that water is an essential factor in metabolic reactions in the body, and it also acts as a lubricant for eyes and um, around joints. It is important to note that whenever there are toxins that are going to be released in the body and you're trying to eliminate them, actually even excess of certain biomolecules, they are going to be water soluble and they are delivered and taken out of the body, for example, in urine, which as you may imagine, it contains water. Lastly, water is also involved in temperature regulation. One of the things is that whenever the body undergoes a rise in temperature, one of the natural reactions that the body has is to actually create sweat. Sweat is actually going to be reducing uh, or having a, a, a cooling effect on that body. So it is important to know that, as you can see, very particular roles and very diverse roles for water in the human body. Now let's focus on looking at water, but at the molecular level. When we look at water at the molecular level, we know that water is a polar molecule. And in previous chemistry courses, you have to understand that it has been discussed what constitutes a molecule uh, being a polar molecule. So understand that the main two items um, that constitute a molecule being polar are containing polar bonds and lack of symmetry. And that is in the majority of the molecules because, as you know, there's always exceptions to the rules. Now, going back to this commentary of polar bonds, understand that a polar bond actually results from a difference in electronegativity for these molecules that are polar. In the case of water, we have, as you can see, 
bonds in which our oxygen atom is going to be bonded to hydrogen atoms. And you can see in that top left corner just a diagram of how a water molecule looks like. Now, one of the things in the symbolisms that we have here is actually illustrating that there is an electronegativity difference between these atoms that are present in water. Just in general, remember that the definition of electronegativity is that it is the tendency of an atom to attract electrons to itself. So when we look at how does that translate in order to see values, then actually we can focus at the bottom left corner image, which is the Pauling scale for electronegativity values. If we focus on that, we notice that fluorine is the most electronegative atom. And if we look, and I'm just going to utilize a different color to highlight it. If we look specifically at this trend table that I highlighted in green, we can see that the trends in the periodic table is that electronegativity increases as we move across a period from left to right towards fluorine and it also increases if we're moving up in a group towards fluorine. Now, if we actually look at the values for oxygen and hydrogen, we can notice that the electronegativity value for hydrogen is going to be 2.1. So I'm just going to write it by my hydrogen atoms. The electronegativity values for oxygen is 3.5. So because oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, we can symbolize this by looking at this delta minus. Remember that this delta minus represents a partial charge. The delta plus that we see here, it represents the partial charge. for hydrogen, but again, it comes from the idea that in comparison to oxygen, hydrogen is more electropositive. That's why it's going to have a positive, it's a partial positive, and it has that S looking thing, it's called a delta, okay? Now, understand that the difference in electronegativity, okay, between the two atoms is what creates these partial charges, okay? As you learn in other chemistry courses, that also results in the formation of a dipole. And this dipole, again, is because these two atoms have a great value in terms of their electronegativity difference. As you can see, the electronegativity difference between the two is about 1.4. So having that dipole shows that if I look at the bond between oxygen and hydrogen, and we have a similar one on the other side of the molecule, this is actually, I'm just going to write it here, a polar covalent bond. So in the case of oxygen, it is a molecule that lacks symmetry because it doesn't have four identical groups, taking into account that it is a tetrahedral molecule. It contains polar bond. So that's why overall water is considered a polar molecule. Now, the solvent properties of water is what um, is determined by its polarity. So the molecules, atoms, uh, the biomolecules, as we're, as we're going to see in this course, that interact with water, it ha it's going to be interacting with water at the molecular level because it's polarity, because it is a polar molecule. Now, you may remember from other chemistry courses that the rule of thumb when it comes to solubility which is going to be the ability of two molecules to interact and to dissolve into one another, is that like dissolves like. So what that means in general, because I'm just going to focus on water, is that a polar solvent, 
like water dissolves polar substances in general. Now, there are some um, specifications when it comes to that, but I will discuss them in a few minutes. Now, in addition for polar solvents dissolving polar substances, we need to take into account that many ionic compounds are soluble in water, but not all. What determines if an ionic compound is going to be soluble in water or not is going to be solubility rules. And as you can see here, in the bottom left corner of the slide, I already gave you a graph for the different solubility rules that you're expected to know for this course. Let's briefly go over solubility rules to remind you of how do I know if a particular ionic compound is going to be soluble in water. So I'm just going to zoom in to look at this closely. These are the solubility rules that I expected for you guys to know. So in this table, we see that we have in the left side, the soluble column. And on the right side, we have the insoluble column. So when we're looking at solubility rules, the first thing that you have to do is look at the anions okay, on the table. And remember that an anion is going to be negatively charged. So let's go, I'm just going to number these um, rows in the column as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have a more organized way to look at this. So as you can see, when we look at our anions on number one, number two, and number three, we look at the following anions, nitrates, chlorates, acetate. And as you can see, they are actually placed on the soluble side of my table. What does this mean? That any compounds that contains those anions are going to be soluble, regardless of the cation that they're paired with. If you have any of the first three, they are going to be soluble. As we move on to number four, I'm just going to use a different color. Understand that sulfates are going to be soluble, okay? But there are going to be some exceptions. So, sulfates become insoluble if they're paired with the following cations. So understand that when a sulfate is paired with the heavy twos, meaning out of group 2A, barium, strontium, calcium, and in addition, if you see any sulfate that is paired with lead and silver, those compounds are going to be insoluble. So understand that the sulfates have an exception. If the cation that is paired with your sulfate is not part of the exceptions that are highlighted in blue, then those sulfates are going to be soluble. Let's move on to the next one, which is the anions that are part of the halogens. So chloride, bromide, iodide. So if you have a compound that contains those anions, for the most part, it's going to be soluble. Now, Similar to what we saw in number four, chloride, bromide, iodide also have an exception. If you have them, chloride, bromide, or iodide paired with silver, mercury, or lead, those cations make the anions of halogens insoluble. Now, 
As we move to the sixth row, remember, we are looking at the anions first. We notice that our anions are going to be on the insoluble side, okay? So, if you have a sulfide, a phosphate, a carbonate, a chromate, okay? They tend to be insoluble. But understand that they can turn into soluble if they're group with anybody from group one, which is group 1A. So your lithium, your sodium, your potassium, your rubidium, okay? Or ammonium. That can make that pair, instead of being insoluble, to make them soluble. Then lastly, if we look at our hydroxides, hydroxides tend to be insoluble. Now, hydroxides can actually turn into soluble. How? If they're paired with anybody from 1A, from 2A, and if they're paired with ammonium. So again, in solubility rules, remember that this is not one side of the table versus the other. You look at the anion, you look at if your anion has exceptions, and based on that, you determine if a particular ionic compound is going to be soluble in water. Now, continuing on. Polar compounds are going to be soluble in water because of the partial charges that they will also have. But understand that there is a limitation here because it depends on the nonpolar character of the molecule. The rule of thumb in organic chemistry is if you have five or more carbons, things start getting to being insoluble, even though if they have a polar side to them, okay? Remember that nonpolar molecules don't tend to dissolve in water because again, if we go back to the rule, like dissolves like, the polarity of a nonpolar molecule is not going to be um, paired with the one of water, which is polar. So because they have opposite polarities, that's why they don't dissolve. Now, understand that when it comes to uh, that point that I just made of the five carbon atoms or more in a molecule, it depends on how a molecule is soluble or not, is because the physical principle of this observation, um, again, is going to depend on the electrostatic interactions of this. So it is important to know how these interactions happen because the different type of bonds that our molecules are going to have are going to affect these interactions. Just a quick reminder from general chemistry, there are two types of bonds. When it comes to many of the molecules that we're going to be observing in biochemistry, they are going to tend to have covalent bonds. And remember that covalent bonds come from the idea that we're going to be sharing electrons between atoms in order for those atoms to have an octet, okay, or to have a full valence shell. In addition of having covalent compounds, we also have ionic compounds, which are going to have ionic bonds. And remember that ionic bonds come from the idea that you have an element that is going to transfer an electron to another element. We tend to see metals transfer electrons to non-metals. And that's why that negative ion, which is known as an anion, is created at the level of the nonmetals. And that positive ion that is known as a cation is created at the level 
of the metal. So this is just a quick review on the type of bonds that we have. Why is it important that we know that molecules or how molecules interact with one another? Because one of the things is that this interaction will actually give rise to attractive forces. So when it comes to biochemistry, I know that in general chemistry and organic chemistry, you have heard of IMF. which stands for intermolecular forces. In biochemistry, we also have them. It's just that we use, utilize a different term, which is called van der Waal forces. Are we talking about the same thing? Yes, pretty much. It's just that because the person that discovered them, his last name was Van der Waals, and he applied it to biomolecules, then we talk about uh, Van der Waal forces. But you will see that there's a lot of similarities um, between uh, intermolecular forces or attractive forces and Van der Waal forces. Understand that these Van der Waal forces play a fundamental role in science. Their definition is that they are a short range of repulsive or attractive intermolecular forces. That's what I meant, um, that they're pretty much IMFs, that are non-covalent associations. And it can happen between atoms, between molecules, between surfaces. And these are going to happen at both gas phases or liquid phases. If we look at the different descriptions of Van der Waal forces, as you can see, these are going to be the intermolecular forces that we observed before. They include dispersion forces, dipole-dipole interactions, and hydrogen bonds. The image, the figure that we have on the right side of the slide actually gives you a summary of the different types of Van der Waal forces or attractive forces, but I'm going to explain them in the following slides in detail, starting with dispersion forces. So where do dispersion forces exist? Dispersion forces are present in all molecules that have electrons. So as you can imagine, all molecules have dispersion forces. It's just that dispersion forces are going to be experienced as the strongest force in nonpolar molecules. So the strongest attractive force or the strongest, the strongest Van der Waal force experienced in nonpolar molecules is going to be dispersion. Now, understand that dispersion forces come from the attraction between temporary dipoles. Overall, they are the weakest attractive forces out of the three that I mentioned on the previous slide. So how do they come about? This is the reality. Electrons in a molecule are always going to be circulating, circulating, circulating. They are not static. At some point, this movement of the electrons is going to create an unsymmetrical distribution. This unsymmetrical distribution, because we have the electrons on one side of the molecule, and then we have the nucleus. And if you remember from general chemistry, the nucleus contains the protons, plus the neutrons. So when that happens, then understand that overall what we observe is that we have the creation of a temporary dipole. We have two poles in our molecule. And this kind of like creates a change of interactions because then the neighboring atoms are also going to be experiencing these temporary dipoles. So this these dispersion forces are going to come from the attraction of the different poles, one negative and one uh, positive, in the neighboring atoms, molecules, so on and so forth. And understand that because the electrons are going to go back in circle 
okay this is going to disrupt this temporary dipole and that's why they are short-lived okay so they just go in and out now we have other type of molecules in chemistry so molecules that have a permanent dipole okay meaning that they have that partial positive at one end and that partial negative at another end but that is permanently because of the electronegativity difference between the elements are going to experience dipole dipole attractions okay so as you can see here we have um, just a traditional example from chemistry here we have the molecule of HCl HCl specifically when we look at the bond between hydrogen and chlorine we know that chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen so that's why it's delta negative that's why our hydrogen is delta plus if we look at the electronegativity difference for them the value for hydrogen is 2.1 and if i go back to the table before chlorine is going to be 3.0 So that means that the electron cloud is going to be pulled towards chlorine a lot. So this molecule, and I'm just going to highlight it in yellow, has a polar covalent bond. Now, because HCl is a molecule that is polar when it's interacting with another molecule of HCl then the attraction that is going to happen that intermolecular force or that van der Waal force that is going to happen between them is going to be a dipole dipole attraction and it comes from the idea again that this molecule is polar so that dipole is not temporary it's actually permanent and now the negative side of one molecule will interact with the positive side of the other one notice that these interactions as it says in the definition when i introduce the van der waals it is non-covalent because this is not an actual bond it is just an attraction that is happening between the molecules lastly we have hydrogen bonds when it comes to hydrogen bonds understand that this is just a special dipole dipole attraction because the hydrogen bonds are going to happen in a polar molecule so what does this mean that specifically we need a specific um, regulation or a specific rule that is going to make our hydrogen bond happen. Your hydrogen needs to be bonded to a highly electronegative atom. That is the rule. In order for have hydrogen bonds or a hydrogen bonding event, understand that that hydrogen must be bonded to an electronegative atom. Which ones? There's actually a specific one. It can be fluorine, it can be oxygen, or it can be nitrogen. So that's why it says that hydrogen bonding must be fun because of the symbols of the elements that need to be attached to the hydrogen in order for hydrogen bonding to occur. Understand that out of the three van der Waal forces that has been discussed so far, hydrogen bonding is going to be the attract the strongest attractive force out of the van der Waals and here we have a molecule of ammonia interacting with itself and as you can see this illustrates a dipole dipole attraction in which the delta positive okay that it is the hydrogen atom and then interacts with the delta negative of the neighbor which is the nitrogen atom and again Ammonia, which is the example that we have here, when it reacts with, with 
when it interacts, I should have said react because there's not a reaction. Um, when it interacts with another molecule of ammonia, it does it through a hydrogen bonding event. Now, understand that when it comes to hydrogen bonding events, um, excuse me, when it comes to attractive forces, other than the three van der Waals that I talked about, there's actually more than those, okay? So ideally, whenever we talk about van der Waals, we say, okay, the van der Waals are dispersion forces, dipole, dipole, and hydrogen bonding. So these extra three that I have placed here, which are I and dipole, IO induced dipole interactions or dipole induced dipole interactions are just going to be part of the attractive forces. We don't include them in the van der Waals. I just wanted to specify that. So I already mentioned hydrogen bonding, dipole dipole, and dispersion. Now, the ones that are going to be added onto because we are going to observe them in this course include ion dipole interactions and then ion dipole interactions is where we see an ion and that ion can be a cation or an anion interacting specifically with the dipole of a polar molecule. So as you can see illustrated in that top box on the left side of this figure, we see specifically how the sodium cation interacts with water molecules. Because sodium is a cation, is positively charged, and we know that in a water molecule, and I'm just going to write the symbols for one of them, since we know that hydrogen is going to be delta positive, but oxygen is delta minus, then the cation is going to interact specifically with the partial negative of the oxygen in the water molecule. Now, we also can see ion induced dipole attractions, where we see it here. Let me just put the right numbers. So this is the other one. So in an ion induced dipole attraction, understand that the ion is going to induce a dipole in the ion, sorry, in an atom or a nonpolar molecule. So understand that now, in the example for number two, we can see chloride anion that now, because it has that negative charge on it, and if we remember, this is going to momentarily going to be interacting with this nonpolar molecule. In this case, we have heptane as our nonpolar molecule because heptane is nonpolar then the induced dipole is going to happen because of the redistribution of electrons. So heptane is going to have a, I'm just going to put a quote unquote, a temporary dipole. So if it interacts, that little bit that interacts with chlorine is because that temporary dipole that is present in that nonpolar molecule is going to interact with the negative charge of our ion. And remember, the positive partial charge in that temporary dipole is what interacts with that anion. Lastly, we can have dipole induced dipole interactions, and we see it here. Now, in that dipole induced dipole interaction, understand that we have a polar molecule on the example that we have here in the figure is water. What it's going to do is that it's going to induce a dipole on an atom. I should um, write here that these uh, dipoles are the temporary onto that nonpolar molecule. So he, in number three, we have the example of looking at a water molecule 
and interacting with an atom of xenon, which is one of the noble gases. So as you can see here in this interaction, what we have is that our polar molecule is going to have a permanent dipole in which that oxygen is negatively charged. Those hydrogens are going to be partially positive charged. So it's going to have an inductive, so it's going to induce a dipole on that nonpolar molecule. But remember that those are going to be temporary. So when we think about the strengths of all of these six different examples, remember the ones on the check mark are the ones that are part of the van der Waals. Ion dipole, ion induced dipole or dipole induced dipole are going to be weaker than the van der Waals uh, forces that I discussed previously.